Writer, editor, and cyberpunk celebrity Are You Serious joins the Plutopia podcast this time as we explore the history of Mondo 2000. Are You Serious was co-founder of that late limited publication and redefined what a magazine could be. I was watching a show called uh, Science 2000. And it was all the most recent tech and science at uh, that point in 1988 or in 1989. Uh, and it was uh, supported by advertising for something called Furnishings 2000. And I uh, flowed it into uh, Queen Moo's bedroom and I said, let's use, change the name and use 2000 to sell stuff. And she immediately said Mondo because somehow she was imagining uh, what the logo would look like. And she thought that would make for a really good logo, which was true. So uh, there you have, a, uh, uh, rather than a trippy, but a very opiated uh, um, origin of uh, becoming Mondo 2000. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of the Plutopia News Network podcast. Our uh, guest today is Are You Serious, who is a writer, editor, talk show host, musician, and a cyber culture celebrity for many years now. Um, he is also best known as the co-founder of the great magazine, or cyberzine, as some called it, Mondo 2000. And he was the original editor-in-chief of Mondo 2000 from 1989 to, what, 93? Yeah. Did you leave in 93? Okay. Yeah, so I, got that straight. I, I wandered off, but I, I returned from time to time. I was still uh, editor-at-large, I think they called it, icon-at-large. I... Uh, I was actually surprised to read that date. I thought you had stayed there much longer, but I guess you, as you say, you were in and out. Uh, but Mondo 2000 wasn't originally Mondo 2000, right? Can you talk about the history of, of Mondo going back to High Frontiers? Yeah, it started as High Frontiers, uh, which was first published in 1984. Uh, the uh, Space Age newspaper of psychedelic science irreverence, modern art, and some other thing that I can't remember. Um, and I'm always embarrassed that we didn't say postmodern art instead of modern art because, you know, I was a total hipster who uh, read uh, semio texts and all that, but somehow I didn't, uh, I didn't get the language because uh, I think because I read everything stoned, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> I, I had an intuitive sense of... Uh, uh, that that we were uh, beyond the uh, logical perimeters of modernism, but uh, I didn't. Uh, the language didn't integrate into uh, my psychology, and therefore didn't make it into the title of the newspaper. But anyway, uh, High Frontiers. I already had the intention to combine. Um, the uh, psychedelic movement, uh, psychedelic. Uh, mm -hmm ideas and attitudes with uh, what everybody then called high technology. Everybody said high tech back then rather than just tech. I don't know what the high was was about, but it conflated nicely with the psychedelic uh, theme. Um, so All the guys is, who were inventing PCs were dropping acid. I think that's what they were referring to. That, that probably was it as, as well. So. Um, yeah, so we started that thing and, and we got rather deep into the psychedelic aspect of it with High Frontiers uh, to some extent uh, uh, less engaged with the uh, uh, digital technology, which really wasn't, it wasn't really in the foreground of our culture. I mean, it was way deep in the background, as a matter of fact, but when we did integrate some stuff and we had interviews with Lee Felsenstein, uh, you know, the marvelous uh, hacker fellow who uh, uh, started, uh, helped to start the hacker conferences and uh, community memory in uh, Berkeley, you know, a pre-social network, social network 
uh, you know, in which computers were located in various places and people could uh, leave uh, messages and uh, et cetera. And he was part of, uh, the name is escaping me, uh, but the uh, meetup group in uh, the South Bay and in Berkeley uh, that is best known for uh, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs introducing the first Apple computer. Although according to Lee and his interesting biography that I'm in the middle of reading right now, that was not the most exciting thing going on. And uh, he was less interested in uh, Steve and Steve than uh, uh, historians might imagine. Oh, I wish I could remember the name of that. Uh, uh, well, Baymug was uh, big uh, when I lived in Berkeley and was getting yeah. the computers. That's where all the... Yeah, this was even before that. Uh, but anyway, I just can't think of the word right now. We'll have to we'll have to pass on, on that. Uh, there was also there a lot of holes in my club. memory. Yeah, that's it. Homebrew computers. Yep. That's it. Uh, amazing history right there. And of course, uh, Monday 2000 had, and High Frontiers before that, had this connection through St. Jude Milhan, who was part of our staff uh, right from early on. And she was well, uh, she was an associate of Lee Feltenstein and uh, Ephraim Lipkin, uh, two of the main uh, people who uh, were engaged in the homebrew computer. And then in, in uh, Steve, Le Stephen Levy's uh, Hacker's book, which was published when I think in '84, maybe. Um, she's the I only. That's uh, right. She's the only woman uh, who is uh, part of uh, that history. Although I do understand there were a few other women who were uh, engaged in the hacking community, the very early hacking community. So High Frontiers. Um, Eventually, we uh, changed it to Reality Hackers. We had first started a newsletter called Reality Hackers uh, to supplement our uh, uh, lazy and never on time publishing schedule uh, so that we could send something to our subscribers as well as just kind of liking the idea of doing a newsletter. And uh, we had Reality Hackers forums at a place called the Julia Morgan Theater, which, as I recall, is pretty substantial. I think it could contain maybe as much as 200 people or 300 people. And uh, uh, we had some, uh, we filled it up, whatever it was. And we had some events like uh, Terrence McKenna and Nick Herbert talking about time travel, a guy who called himself Saint. Silicon uh, doing his comedy routine. Um, Rudy Rucker uh, talking about cyberpunk way early on. Um, and then uh, I decided that uh, we should call the magazine Reality Hackers to uh, round us more in the uh, techno culture. This was around 1987, 1988. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, hackers were hanging out at the house that we called Quail House at the time. It was a little mini mansion up in the Berkeley Hills with kind of a, a gothic look. So uh, MG uh, in the driveway, and it, it just had a certain a certain goth look. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, we were hanging out with these people. Uh, uh, as High Frontiers, we found ourselves in the midst of uh, the uh, Palo Alto uh, computer culture. Uh, we were invited to parties at the house of uh, Dan Kotke, who was uh, part of a triumvirate, really, with Steve and Steve in the invention of Apple. He was Steve Jobs' roommate when he was dropping acid he went to uh, India with him and they were kind of uh, partners of a sort um, and he uh, created the keyboards for the original Macintosh which we had the honor of having in the uh, High Frontiers house along with a uh, 
one of the original Macs uh, that he lent us. There, there are a lot of cases in which people say, oh, we lent you that. <laughs> we, we thought we were given those things. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, so uh, we became reality hackers, uh, which the, the first issue had a little Mondo 2000 insignia on it, or I'm sorry, a, a High Frontiers insignia on it so that uh, our distributors and subscribers and uh, outlets could recognize that we were uh, still part of uh, that uh, stream of publishing. But uh, nonetheless, Reality Hackers confused everybody. People didn't know what hackers were. Literally uh, hadn't heard of hackers in, uh, in the distribution chain. And uh, some uh, magazine stands uh, put us in the true crime section. Uh, Either they thought that hackers were criminals or uh, we uh, were given to understand that uh, one or two actually thought it was about hacking people up. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that uh, we had become uh, Manson family acolytes or something along those lines. And, and although we were fairly twisted, uh, we were... Uh, not inclined to hack people up or become Manson family acolytes. Uh, so uh, Reality Hackers only lasted two issues um, and it sold worse than High Frontiers. High Frontiers had gone up to almost 20,000, which was very good for a zine within the zine culture. We were, we were doing very well. Um, and Reality Hackers actually went down in sales and we came up with the name Mondo 2000 or that uh, to uh, uh, Queen Moo's uh, credit, she came up with the Mondo. I just came up with the 2000 because I was uh, watching um, TV stoned on uh, uh, a narcotic actually, unusually, not on a psychedelic or anything, but uh, uh, the person who used to cook our ecstasy used to bring me a uh, dose of morphine uh, every other month or every twice a month. And I uh, would uh, spend Friday nights enjoying just relaxing anything that happened to be on television. And in this case, I was watching a show called uh, Science 2000. And it was all the most recent tech and science at uh, that point in 1988 or 1989. Uh, and it was uh, supported by advertising for something called Furnishing 2000. And I uh, floated into uh, Queen Moo's bedroom and I said, let's use, change the name and use 2000 to sell stuff. And she immediately said Mondo because somehow she was imagining uh, what the logo would look like. And she thought that would make for a really good logo, which was true. So uh, there you have a, uh, uh, rather than a trippy, but a very opiated uh, um, origin of uh, becoming Mondo 2000 from Reality Hackers. Well, the so we reality decided hacking. to change the name. Your reality hacking uh, was also in, um, involved with uh, smart drugs. I remember reading a lot of uh, stuff about your explorations of smart drugs. How did that come about? Um, yeah, I mean, I was totally influenced uh, right from the start and, and starting High Frontiers uh, with Timothy Leary's uh, smile configuration, space migration, intelligence increase, and life extension. And uh, he was already talking about smart drugs uh, back in the late 70s or early 80s. So uh, we were following up on whatever rumors we could find about anything that actually would uh, work in terms of uh, intelligence increase, nutrients, chemicals, plants, uh, et cetera. Uh, Dirk Pearson and San, their, Sandy Shaw came out with the life extension uh, handbook 
very early on was that in the late 70s or early 80s and that had some suggestions and and data uh, about things like vasopressin and uh, various nutrients uh, all of which escape my memory uh, I have a bad memory because I forgot to take all my memory drugs um, uh, so all that kind of stuff was in the air and uh, we would hear from various people talking about uh, memory enhancement and of course there was hydrogen invented by albert hoffman uh, which uh, i believe he advocated it's a memory drug um, and also i think he as well as other people advocated microdosing lsd as an intelligence enhancer uh, which is something that's uh, being popularized and going around right now uh, as well as an antidepressant uh, memory enhancer a creativity enhancer uh, so all those things i mean it is psychedelics and intelligence drugs kind of uh, were mixed together uh, in the uh, minds of chemists and uh, uh, upcoming reality hackers uh, i think i invented that term but I, i'm not sure I think it might have been Alan Lindell who was hanging out at our house. Who, who I said we weren't, we're not hackers. We had a bunch of hackers hanging out. And I said that uh, shamefully that uh, the people at High Frontiers were not computer hackers. And Alan Lindell said, you're reality hackers. I think that's where that came from. Um, but anyway, so all those things were in the air at the time. John Morgenthaler, who uh, ended up writing for us about smart drugs and marketing smart drugs uh, was part of the uh, contingent that would come uh, from uh, Santa Cruz or the South Bay. They'd visit with Alan Lindell and some people from down there. And so we started to get informed about these potential uh, smart drugs, which, of course, people say don't work. Um, <laughs> so there, there's that issue. Uh, I, in my conclusion, uh, upon taking them, is that there were mild stimulants. Basically, that's what they were. Uh, whether they improved or enhanced memory is a matter of debate. Uh, but I've seen uh, articles recently saying that caffeine is good for you and uh, that it is good for memory. Um, so uh, I have some right here. Yeah. And so being overstimulated might help uh, uh, create, uh, you know, uh, imprint, imprint memories uh, with a higher function than uh, just normal states of waking consciousness. Yeah, I think stimulants are good for focus and focus is good for memory, I suppose. Yeah. The drug yeah. that I was taking at the time was called Puracetum. Do you remember Puracetum? Yeah, that was one of the ones. I took that for a while. I found it back yeah. after a while. It started to make me woozy for whatever reason. But I was super overstimulated at the time. So I was drinking, you know, like three cups of coffee and uh, washing it down with espresso and uh, occasional cocaine was in the mix and, you know, uh, microdosing LSD was in the mix. So I was super hyper overstimulated. So I'm not sure what set me back. And at some point uh, made me woozy rather than alert. But uh, uh, paracetam, yeah, I don't know. I thought it was pretty good for a while. You were collaborating with Timothy Leary for a while, right? You wrote a book with him? Um. My name is, is on a uh, book co-written with Timothy Leary. But as I like to tell people, uh, it was easy to collaborate with him because he was dead at the time. Um, so he uh, didn't, uh, so he wasn't difficult. Um, so yeah, no, the, uh, the book, uh, Design for Dying, um, was originally Timothy Leary and... Uh, he was in collaboration with somebody named, last name Pierce, uh, but they didn't complete the thing. And I was contacted by Douglas Rushkoff, who had uh, been the agent 
for the uh, uh, Leary estate and made the uh, deal. And he was desperate to have somebody complete the book for him. So I stepped in uh, for a uh, what to me was a fairly good amount of money uh, uh, and completed it in a terrible rush in about a month or, or so. I mean, I did collaborate with Tim with on Mondo and, and so forth, the reality hackers. He was uh, a, a very generous uh, author of many articles. Yeah, he was connected with Fringeware too, a little bit. We were no. selling his products, actually. I can't remember what we saw. We had some product that we had some products from Timothy Leary and front, some from Terrence McKenna. Those were the days. Yeah. Well, he had the uh, software Mind States, Mind Mind Mirror. Uh, that mm. was one thing. He Mind would, Wave he Zero. Was, Mind Wave Zero was one. Was it Mind Wave Zero? Is that Mind it? Mind Mirror, maybe? Uh, Time Wave was uh, McKenna. Time Wave Zero. Time Wave Zero. That Time was McKenna. Was You're McKenna right. McKenna and Mind Mirror was, uh, was Leary's uh, psych psychological uh, self uh, self improvement uh, software program. It was pretty entertaining and uh, fun. Um, but uh, yeah, he used to write for us for free, and he had the collaborations with Eric Gullickson that he presented through uh, uh, Reality Hackers and Mondo 2000. So um, back when you were doing Mondo 2000, the internet was just starting to be a thing. Were you were you were you very aware of the internet? when you made the conversion to Reality Hackers and then to Mondo 2000, or is it something that just sort of, was it more like that was a wave that came through that you caught because all of these other things sort of aligned with it? People advertised uh, connections through the internet as early as High Frontiers. Uh, so I was aware of it, but, um, I wasn't ready to struggle with the process of having uh, the uh, right equipment to actually go on there and uh, do it myself. And, you know, St. Jude was part of our mix and she was aware of it and she was probably engaged in some ways uh, early on with uh, some of the uh, uh, you know, hacker boards or whatever was going on very early on. Um, I just finally, it was coaxed maybe by you, John, uh, onto the well. Uh, I, th I think that we, we got there independently. The thing that I did was suggest that we create that Mondo 2000 conference on the well yeah. that turned out to be quite a busy conference for a while. Yeah, I think I got there a little bit before that um, and, uh, you know, wandered around trying to figure out what the heck was going on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the well was such an amazing place, such intelligent people. Uh, you know, I mean, it was it was elite in uh, many ways. Uh, and uh, it uh, it was better for it at, at that time. Um, you know, I mean, it was... Uh, really uh, yeah, an example of what social networking could be uh, before um, it uh, had to be monetized and uh, uh, you know, had to deal with um, mass attacks from uh, uh, young people and people in their 20s just being sadistic for the hell of it. And, all the all the shitification stuff that has occurred uh, since then. So yeah, yeah. Man, well, it was a marvelous place, and and is even today. Yeah, um, yeah. I remember. I remember. I w was once talking to the manager of the well, and she was telling me that that at one point most of the pe new people who were new signups for the well were coming for the Mondo 2000 conference. And she also said that most of those people dropped off quickly because they wouldn't pay the bill. 
<laughs> oh yeah <laughs> that, that makes total sense yeah yeah we got a, a rascally uh crowd but also uh, uh some pretty great uh contributors in there you know uh, tiffany lee brown i think might have come in through uh the mondo uh invitation i mean it, it appeared I'm in our magazine sure. came it appeared in our magazine fairly early on that the uh, people could connect with us through uh, the well and through the conference, the Mondo conference on the well. Uh, marvelous, uh, marvelous discourses uh, that uh, went on there. Uh, lots of, lots of madness. Uh, who was the anarchist woman who uh, used to bother people, uh, piss people off a lot? Uh, uh, she, uh, that was Humdog, I think. Humdog, That's what you were yeah, thinking about. Carmen was, Hermosillo, yeah. Yeah, she was great. And she unfortunately uh, committed suicide, I believe, uh, uh, some years after that. Uh, uh, she wrote a great piece uh, for uh, a later Mondo 2000, the one that I guest edited actually after I'd uh, already had my walkabout. Uh, it was the one with Reese Witherspoon on, on the cover. And we had interviews with Howard Rheingold and other people who were starting a, uh, an early social network called Electric Minds. Um, and um, it was to be a commercial social media site, uh, um, but it was also uh, to avoid, uh, to try to avoid some of the traps, uh, some of the darker aspects of things that later occurred when uh, uh, social media sites went the way of uh, Facebook and, and uh, other uh, profit-seeking, uh, rent-seeking organizations like, uh, like that. Uh, but uh, Humdog wrote a criticism, uh, basically uh, 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 bringing out the uh, fact that the uh, uh, worker providing content to a social media site was also the consumer paying for content on the social media site. And that this was one of the contradictions of capitalism that was going to be unavoidable in the uh, social media arena. And uh, yeah, she, she was, I think she, she was, was one seeing of the ahead to, yeah. uh, to uh, raised that and it was in mondo and uh howard was a little upset with us for uh, running that actually but i think it was pretty insightful well i can also say i so humdog and i were pretty good friends and we actually ceased to be friends over this i was working for electric minds oh yeah and she was complaining <laughs> she referred to it as the commodification of community uh -huh. and uh and she was implying uh, I guess, bad faith on the part of Howard and some of the rest of us that were involved. And I had some fairly intense arguments with her about this, uh, mostly, I guess, on the well. And there was some other place that we went where, uh, uh, where we were having this conversation. And Mark Meadows was there, and he was trying to sort of referee this uh argument yeah, that humdog yeah. and i were having but we we never were as friendly with each other after that it was uh yeah. mark it was Meadows, a difficult mark time Meadows but has, has uh, dedicated some uh, energy to uh re retaining some of uh carmen hammercia's uh writings and and all that and uh, putting that stuff out and uh, you know yeah i think uh uh that uh, suspecting bad intentions on the part of people like Howard and yourself and the uh, people at Electric Minds uh, was a mistake. Uh, the, the, the criticism of, uh, of how it works in terms of uh, uh, commodification was probably legitimate. So that, yeah, the, she wasn't able to separate those, those two things. You know, when you look at the current state of social media, Electric Minds is pretty uh, much a uh, easygoing thing. When you if you talk about commodification and then shitification, uh, <laughs> you go to Facebook and uh, you can uh, 
you, you actually probably want to go take a shower or something. <laughs> I've yeah, no, you know, no, it was stuff. benign. It was uh, decidedly benign. Um, yeah, what I uh, what a mess now. I, I, I don't know where to begin, but um, yeah. Did you have to deal with the censorship Nazis back in the days of Mondo 2000? Because you weren't exactly like uh, you know, we, Saturday Evening Post or Good Housekeeping. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we weren't politically correct either. Um, you know, uh, and uh, we never got a lot of heat from, from the left either uh, during, during the Mondo times. And it was such a different time such a different moment um you know uh i remember the writings about do uh i mean that the, the uh yeah it, it was so different uh i uh am hesitant to even stand step into that landmine right now but um no we didn't we didn't have problems with censorship i mean we had complexities of our own within within mondo i mean uh, back in the uh, High Frontiers reality hackers uh, days, uh, Queen Mu was hesitant to uh, uh, publish a diagram showing people how to hack uh, ATMs. And uh, Morgan Russell, the uh, uh, co-publisher and uh, author of the article uh, called, I believe, ATMs and the Rise of the Hacker, Leisure class was very upset about that, uh, and we didn't we didn't run that uh, diagram that would easily have uh, been happily uh, published and probably was by 2600 another uh, more dedicated uh, you know hacker uh, specifically hacker uh, periodicals. So I mean we ran into that kind of thing. Um, we had uh, a uh, advertisement. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the company right now, uh, but it showed two pictures of a naked baby side by side. And one just showed the naked baby and another sh showed the naked baby pissing on itself. And it said better or good and then better or best and better. And uh, one of the people who had uh, money uh, invested in the magazine was upset about that advertising up here. So there were all there were these little uh, conflagrations that uh, would arise. Uh, there was the uh, negative land prank on the edge uh, from uh, from you too uh, that. Uh, Queen Mo didn't want to run, not because uh, Island Records was an advertiser, but because, but just because we thought we'd featured Negative Land too much, uh, and that turned into a, uh, a big crisis. Uh, but uh, it did wind up getting getting run. And just to give some background on that. Uh, uh, Negative Land had read it, had uh, released an album called titled U2, uh, in which they sampled uh, some stuff from U2 and other stuff, and they were sued by Island Records on behalf of the band U2. And then, uh, The Edge, uh, you know, the uh, guitar player, uh, most people will know this already. Uh, from the band U2, uh, his agent contacted Mondo 2000 saying uh, that the Edge and the people in U2 felt that uh, U2's uh, then current Zoo TV uh, tour was pretty cyberpunk and that uh, Mondo 2000 should do an interview with them and that it might, uh, something really unique <laughs> might emerge from the interview, uh, uh, probably not being aware that uh, I was pretty close with the people at Negative Land. Uh, so I organized it so that Negative Land would uh, conduct the interview along with myself. And uh, so they started the interview uh, talking to the edge about uh, uh, 
zoo TV's use of uh, found materials of uh, other people's stuff at their uh, concerts, uh, which which they would uh, which they would do, including uh, taking stuff from uh, George Bush. Uh, and they talked about the ownership of material and the legitimacy of using found material from other sources as part of your mix uh, in a creative product. And then uh, after uh, listening to this for a while, I finally intervened and told him who I told the edge <laughs> who he was talking to and uh, went on from there. Uh, ended with uh, Mark Hoffler from Negative Land uh, complaining about how much uh, money it was costing them uh, to deal with the uh, uh, Island Records lawsuit and asking the Edge for a loan. And the Edge held with laughter and <laughs> said this was the most surreal interview I've ever, I've ever done. And this was followed out. Uh, uh, the owner of Island Records, um, name escaped me, but uh, he. Uh, it was Chris. Chris something. Chris, yeah, Chris something, and he uh, lived part of the time in Jamaica and provided uh, Timothy and Barbara Leary with their vacation home in Jamaica when they would like to, where they would like to go for holidays, and so he tried to. Uh, intervene and get some kind of debt forgiveness but uh, uh, I don't believe that went anywhere um, so yeah. Chris Blackwell Chris Blackwell. that was his name Chris yeah, Blackwell yeah. yeah so anyway that was you remember one. uh do you remember when we uh, we were at one point we were trying to do an Austin issue of Mondo 2000 uh, and I Queen Mu vetoed that pretty quickly but I that, that could have been interesting I think yeah, that was, that was at a time when I was really out of, pretty out of touch with things. So I only heard about it after. Um, yeah, I mean, when I... You were with Jude on that. Yeah. When I moved to San Francisco, I started focusing my energy on Mondo Vanilli, the uh, musical spinoff of uh, Mondo 2000. And I was living with uh, Dave Fleminger, a.k.a. Scrappy Duchamp, and... Uh, we were very close, close to where Simone Thurdon was living in San Francisco. So, so my center of gravity was was there. Uh, so even though I was still friendly, um, uh, yeah, uh, my yeah, uh, I didn't get a lot of uh, feedback or data about what was going on with Mondo at at that time. And what was the history of Mondo Vanilli? That, has that been kind of on again, off again, or did you do that pretty consistently for a while? I mean, we were focused on, on a, a single thing, which was, uh, you know, well, two things, performance art and then uh, an album. And uh, we put together, uh, I can't remember the term for it, but a, a sampler of, of three songs and, and it took it down to LA to uh, try to seek out the contacts in the record industry. And uh, we happened into a housewarming party uh, given by uh, Trent Reznor, uh, who had just moved into the uh, house at uh, Cielo Drive where uh, <laughs> Uh, Sharon Tate had been uh, murdered by the Manson family. So uh, the Manson name comes up once again in our uh, conversation. And yet I still insist that uh, none of us were uh, warm to hacking people up. Uh, but um, so uh, we went to that party uh, a little bit buzzed on ecstasy, or at least I was, and Simone was fully buzzed on ecstasy, as yes, was uh, Timothy Leary, who uh, came with us. And uh, we met Trent, and we gave him our uh, uh, audio, I believe it was an audio tape at that time. I mean, this is a early technology, right, 1993. Um, and uh, 
he was high on shrooms when he listened to it. Uh, we gave him a very irreverent paper along with it uh, that made fun of the music industry. He really liked that. Uh, but he liked the music, and he said uh, he'd like to get us uh, signed to his uh, new record company, which is the subsidiary of Interscope called Nothing Records. Uh, and he was being uh, supported in signing six uh, musical acts to his uh, new record company. And uh, when he came down from the psilocybin, he still liked it and um, came to see us in San Francisco and they sent us a contract and a whole lot of complexity uh, started from there. Um, our lawyer was too good. Uh, we had a connection to a lawyer through somebody who knew a lot of people in the music industry, like the Rolling Stones and stuff like that. So the quality of our lawyer in terms of the music industry, I mean, she represented Michael Jackson and people like that. Uh, so, and Trent had promised us a very friendly contract. And what we got was a very typical uh, unfriendly music industry contract. So the combination of it not being a real good contract and uh, uh, having sending a high powered lawyer after his representatives uh, uh, kind of complicated the whole scene and it ended up with the uh, that in con combination with the fact that we went a little over our $90,000 budget and everybody else following Trent's uh, example were going over budget. Uh, and so Interscope cracked down on nothing records uh, both of them were also being attacked by uh, the Tipper Gore uh, PMRC uh, politics that were going on at the time. So somehow all those things converged into a bad vibe. Um, and uh, uh, Reznor was faced with the reality that uh, he could only release uh, one act and he chose to go with uh, Marilyn Manson who had the you know, much better uh, uh, customer uh, base at the time and also had, to, to be honest, an excellent album at the time, uh, what was called uh, 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 Anti Antichrist Superstar. Uh, so that was his decision to uh, uh, go with uh, Marilyn, which, uh, Vibe-wise, uh, many years later, might have proved to be a uh, bad decision, uh, but uh, no one had any reason to suspect that Manson would be a wife abuser at uh, at that time. Um, I mean, well, you married Marilyn Manson, but anyway. Um, so. Uh, so it went into a void uh, because the uh, lawyers at Interscope wanted their $90,000 back and none of us had the money or, or the intention to give them that. Uh, but eventually we decided it had all been forgotten. And sometime in, in this uh, millennium, we uh, put the album out in various places, including on my band camp, and uh, I might be uh, seeking a record contract for it again at, at this moment uh, with some uh, representative representation um, by the uh, Austin Music Critic, uh, who we talked about earlier. I'm not sure I should drop his name uh, at this moment, uh, but... Uh, uh, maybe later, somewhere further down. The here. secret, the secret private Austin yeah. music critic. Yeah. This uh, all, talking about all this kind of reminds me. Do you remember when Billy Idol showed up on the well? Oh yeah. Were you involved in that at all? Yeah. That yeah. Was, he was recording an album called Cyberpunk. Yeah. He and he wanted. Uh... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. he contacted uh, uh, Gareth Branwyn 
and said he had been inspired by a Garris article in Mondo 2000, uh, or in the Mondo 2000 book, which, uh, uh, which was actually something that Gareth had written on the well that I think we sort of stole <laughs> um, and uh, included in the book without really consulting with Gareth. But, you know, we were all pals. Uh, and anyway, so uh, Billy uh, contacted uh, Gareth and uh, asked about being able to use that and uh, read his version of a dramatic reading of his take on what uh, cyberpunk was. Um, he, uh, Billy told him he was uh, uh, thinking of the opening of that uh, Moody Blues uh, song, you know, the gathering gloom, uh, that one. Um, so yeah, um, it ended up uh, with uh, Billy using it uh, for his cyberpunk album and Billy got in touch with everybody. Uh, I got in touch with uh, Mark Fraunfelder and Carla uh, from yeah. Boing Boing. Um, I don't know if he got in touch with uh, you guys at Fringewear, but he got in touch with Yeah, me. he was in touch with me, yeah. Yeah, and I got an invitation to visit, which, uh, uh, or to, to uh, meet with him, which uh, happened to coincide with my trip to Los Angeles. So that worked out, and we got to meet with Billy and got to hear... Uh, his version of heroin, uh, which is on the cyberpunk album uh, and the video made by Brent was Leonard, who is a friend to uh, Mondo. Uh, and I think uh, spent part of his time in the Bay Area, but was also in Los Angeles. So we got to hang out and go to his party with Tim and uh, watch, uh, watch the Brett Leonard video over and over again uh i think uh, uh billy might have been a little coked up at the time uh so there was the tendency to uh, uh do do the same thing over and over again and get real excited about it um but uh, anyway uh, that was quite a scene uh details of which i probably won't go into right now uh but uh yeah that was fun how is it that i mean it was my recollection is that high frontiers and reality hackers were pretty like convinced they they were not slick magazines but mondo 2000 was like a slick fashion magazine was that mm -hmm. queen muse idea is that where that came from I think it was both of our ideas, uh, but I think it was her idea to uh, damn the expenses each time around and, uh, you know, go for the best quality paper and, and that kind of thing. I mean, I think we both talked about how much fun it would be to uh, make it look nice and how much we both loved wet magazine and you know we both enjoyed looking at vanity fair and uh, uh you know isn't it fun to just do magazines for the sake of magazines and not get too hung up on uh being the uh, uh nerds magazine or the countercultures magazine and you know isn't it great just to have a magazine and go for broke i think we we're both on kind of on the same page uh, with that. Uh, I mean, there were issue two of High Frontiers, uh, 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 art directed by uh, Mark Franklin, aka Lord Knows, was also a uh, dynamic display of art direction, uh, although uh, it wasn't that slick in terms of the paper. It was 11 by 17, um, and it had uh, wild artwork uh, throughout it and a giant pink cover with Art Linkletter saying kids do the darndest drugs and uh, a three-eared, three-armed Mickey Mouse uh, holding a, uh, a uh, blotter of Central Intelligence Agency LSD and uh, 
uh, Nancy uh, Reagan as Kali uh, centerfold uh, thing. Um, and also uh, issue six, the uh, final issue of Reality Hackers was had a great design uh, that was sort of a, more of a minimalist uh, style with uh, a lot of white backgrounds that was done by Roger Rapp, who uh, did most of the artwork for Dungeons and Dragons and uh, dropped out and moved to uh, Berkeley to uh, work with us and uh, lasted uh, one issue uh, before uh, running away, uh, screaming back to uh, Wisconsin <laughs> after uh, having some uh, uh, genuinely uh, disturbing experiences uh, with us uh, uh, that uh, uh, didn't have anything to do with uh, me or Queen Moo, but uh, was decidedly at the hands of uh, our resident uh, hacker threat, uh, uh, Michael Synergy. <laughs> uh, another uh, crazy story uh, that uh, I go into it to some degree in the uh, in in my memoir slash history of Mondo 2000, the freaks in the machine, Mondo 2000, and late 20th century tech culture, which uh, we just revealed uh, now uh, is once again under contract uh, with, um, oh God, I can't think of the name right now, um, about a uh, book company, uh, uh, people can look it up. It's all over the internet at the moment, but I have uh, memory holes in my brain. Um, so that we had built a website one time uh, that you were using to gather stories from kind yes. of everybody about Mondo history. Are, are you incorporating any of that in, in to this book? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's in collaboration with Sherrod Sher Chess, who um, teaches out of uh, University of Georgia, I think. I, not sure of the exact uh, name, but uh, she brings uh, some uh, uh, detail and fact-checking or orientation to the uh, project. Um, I think we may end up even using more of other people's voices in the final version uh, as I kind of ran away with the ball, uh, kind of out of necessity and, and did a, made a lot of it my own memoir. And uh, now it's being sort of reoriented and, and reworked. Uh, and um, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, there was always going to be an oral history aspect to it. And I think it may end up being even more of one than uh, it uh, ended up being in, in the manuscript that I produced uh, about five or six years back. And how did you get connected with her, your collaborator? I'm not sure who made the introduction, actually. I'm forgetting who made the introduction. Um, yeah. Uh, but it just felt like the right and, kind of complementary <laughs> set of skills. Yeah, it's absolutely perfect. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my work uh, needs some grounding and uh, factuality. And uh, <clears throat> also, she's younger. And, you know, she uh, wasn't really there during the Mondo <clears throat> epoch. Uh, so she brings uh, with her a sense of some of the need to explain us to younger people <clears throat> and uh, also as a, a feminist writer she brings with her an urge to make me a little less cringe which uh, <laughs> could end up uh, having some value if you were if you were going to create 
Mondo 2000 today, if you wanted to try to do that, what form would it take? Is that something that could even happen now? Yeah, I mean, I do have the Mondo2000.com website, um, but kind of lost interest in trying to make uh, regular contact con or content on there. I have I have no idea what uh, what that would be. Um, I'm not sure it's not a vibe uh, which of which its time has passed, but I'm sure some people would uh, not agree with that observation and there might be some way to uh, uh, bring it into a uh, contemporary context. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, what or how. Scoop, did you have something? Yeah, I had to, I, I was slow on the draw there with the uh, mute. That mute. <laughs> <laughs> but your observation about the younger person, yeah, I've found from working in media over the years that if it's a subject that you're really, you were part of, it's hard to back off and describe it to people who weren't there. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really good choice of having someone who can stand back and observe what it is that you're trying to communicate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely necessary, I think. I, I never had any idea how uh, what I was uh, putting together would land with uh, people who were other than uh, Mondo fans. Uh, I always felt like it should land, uh, particularly with people, you know, from from boomers through Gen X. Uh, but people before that, uh, I, I would I was always hard pressed to uh, figure out how it how it could be understood. I mean, I always wonder how people understand the context of some of the music they listen to. You know, how, how can you appreciate the Sex Pistols or uh, the Beatles psychedelic period without understanding the context of how, or the Ramones, uh, understand the context of how people freaked out people were by the Beatles becoming hippies or by the emergence of punk and how uh, punk to uh, hippies just seemed like a bunch of people who wanted to beat everybody up and kill everybody or something at first uh, you know didn't totally understand the cartoonish satirical edge of of that kind of stuff um, because now everything seems kind of flattened right i mean it doesn't seem to be any context for uh anything in pop culture being uh, threatening or uh, exciting in a subversive way, uh, you know, aside from Nazis, uh, which, you know, one does not want to uh, have to deal with. Um, yeah, the whole music business uh, lately has become so monopoly. Uh, it, it's a monopoly of just a few companies that... Yeah. It, you know, when you get in that situation, they're going to go for the lowest common denominator and uh, bands like, you know, the, the Ramones or Talking Head or Devo or any of those guys would just uh, not have been possible with that kind of music business. It, you know, right, that... right. And of course, the big stars of uh, that that have uh, made their way through the corporate environment, you know, that. They will show up wearing a Ramones T-shirt or a Devo T-shirt. They they ref, they reference that culture, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, the, the, at the center of that industry is uh, uh, it's impenetrable. Uh, yeah. There's such a glut of music outside the mainstream that, uh, uh, as someone who uh, in recent years has really decided that I enjoy writing. Uh, lyrics and doing recording uh, projects more than I enjoy writing. Uh, the uh, difficulty 
of getting through that glut and getting people to decide they actually want to listen to what you've uh, produced uh, is something that um, is, uh, I don't want to use the word tormenting, but uh, is uh, uh, confounding me uh, at the moment. Uh, you know, there's just too much music. I mean, I see stuff all the time that where I say, oh, yes, I'm interested in listening to that. And then I never listen to it because there are so many options. Yeah, I mean, recorded music is kind of a, it's almost commodified right now, whereas performance, you know, performance is kind of like if you're a musician, you have to make your money performing. You really can't yeah. make your money recording. Yeah. Uh, but you kind of have to record to get the performances. So it's kind yeah. of a, it's such a different ecosystem than it was when, you know, like 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm not trying to depend on music to make a living. Yeah, I, I wouldn't consider depending on it to try to make a living, but uh, I would love to get the stuff heard. Um, but we'll see what happens with our friend from Austin, maybe yes, uh, something will, uh, will pop. I think Austin would be a great place to break an album like that. Yeah, Austin is I actually the whole, we're sort of living in the world that Philip Dick and the cyberpunks were telling us, you know, could exist. And in fact, I think maybe they had some influence in, in pushing people in that direction. I don't know. It seems like we sort of moved into the cyberpunk era. Uh, mm. Certainly everybody's kind of a cyborg right now. Yeah. And also, I, I mean, people, people really like cyberpunk right now. There's a, there's a popularity <clears throat> thing with cyberpunk for sure because it reflects so well on, on uh, contemporary life. Yeah, I know. It used to be science fiction, and now it's just the world we're living in. Yeah. Well, we have we have actually reached the end of the hour. I can't believe it. It feels like we've just been talking for a few minutes, but thank you so much for joining us today, and, and we should come back and talk some more, because there, there was a lot more that I wanted to cover that we never got to. Well, when your project I know, I comes out... Talk, I thought we were going to talk about the open source party, <laughs> and I, I studied up on it. Mm -hmm. But we'll do that another time. Something yep. that didn't happen. Yeah, when you come okay. to well, that, we could take. Yeah, could come to Austin. Well, I'm just say when your project comes out because uh, you know this is an audience that uh, you would appeal to. Oh yeah, we'll definitely do that. Well, let's take two or three minutes at least. Uh, we'll extend a, a little bit because you're right. We should have talked about the open source party. Um, um, you and I and Chris Novoselic put that thing together and then it really didn't happen. And I realize now that I was being kind of naive. I didn't realize how, how difficult it would be to actually create a whole new political party. What are your thoughts about that now? Yeah, I mean, what happened with me, I was just looking at uh, my original proposal was before Barack Obama got elected president, never mind Donald Trump. Um, and um, my thing at the time, uh, as we were in the discussion, um, it was agreed that uh, by everybody except me that I should be the figurehead and the uh, main uh, person, uh, the main front man for the party. And uh, I was just looking at uh, yeah. the vibe around politics at the time, and I was looking at the vulnerability of uh, my partner, Eve, who had had a, two strokes. And I was thinking, no, I don't want to deal with uh, uh, what uh, was in the air uh, in terms of being a political figure at that moment. And, and after that, Trump came along. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter came along. Me Too came along. And uh, what we were doing then, um, it included, it was about democratization and it was about access 
and it included uh, no mention of uh, race or gender. Um, and, you know, looking back on it, uh, given the need to grow a party and have a populist appeal, as much as that might have been a cool thing in, in its way, because all you really have to do is have democratization and then axiomatically you have a multiracial democracy the thing that the republican party is desperately trying to avoid um but uh not having not dealing with those uh concerns uh you know it just wouldn't fly uh in the uh post trump era for sure so I, I think now I think that we had a really, really good idea of making an open source party. In other words, bringing open source principles into politics yeah. and really focusing on transparency and collaboration. Yeah. Uh, and it would be inherently democratic. And somebody was just telling me, they said, well, what you should have done was just try to like get the Democratic Party on board with that instead of trying to create a separate party. And maybe that Maybe that's true. Maybe that makes sense. Yeah, it's rough. I mean, well, I mean, the DMC does not seem to be too anxious to uh, democratize the Democratic Party. I mean, it's an ironic situation where the uh, uh, the only force we have to uh, defend democracy against uh, outright fascists are, are themselves pretty undemocratic but i mean there are certainly forces within the democratic party who would want to embrace uh what we were what we were trying to do yeah yeah i thought we would prevail because we had a, a really good bass player that's true but yeah yeah i mean Navasalik, uh, <laughs> uh, could, have, could have been a strong force <clears throat> that's for sure I just wanted to replace Kurt Whoa. as the lead singer of Nirvana. That was my secret plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should uh, we should gather again in a couple of months after the election and talk about this some more because, you know, maybe we can float that open source politics idea um, in some way that would have impact in the future. Uh, yeah. Unless we go like all in Nazi in the yeah. next election, fingers yeah. crossed there. Touch and go. Okay, well, yeah, let's do that. Well, thanks so much for joining us. All right. We'll talk Thank to you, you again soon. All hey, right. Take God care. See you. All right. Take care. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.